In this video we are going to get the instantaneous acceleration vector of an object undergoing uniform circular motion. Now suppose that at time t the velocity of the object is v of t. Let's suppose that a small interval of time delta t elapses. So the object moves from here to here. At time t, the velocity of the object is v of t. We know that that velocity vector is tangential to the circle. And at time delta t later, the velocity of the object is given by v of t plus delta t. Now these two velocity vectors are different because they point in different directions. Um, the magnitudes are the same because we're dealing with uniform circular motion. Let's suppose that we want the average acceleration of the object as it moves from here to here. Well, to do that, we need to get the change in the velocity of the object. So we need to get the final velocity, which is v of t plus delta t, and subtract the initial velocity vector, v of t. Next, we must divide that d difference in the velocity by the time taken for the difference to occur, and that time is delta t. It's some small interval of time. Now we can also write what's on top here as delta v, meaning the difference in the velocities. Now the formula that you just saw should remind you of the formula for the acceleration of an object undergoing uniform linear motion, that is motion in a straight line with constant acceleration. We saw that it's the final velocity minus the initial velocity divided by the time taken. Actually the v and the u are really vector quantities, but we leave off the arrows because there are only two directions to consider. And uh, you know, um, those directions are given by a plus or a minus sign. So for the case of linear motion, those arrows are often omitted, but we must always be aware that we're dealing with vector quantities, and the acceleration likewise is a vector. See, we've difference of two vectors divided by a scalar. T is not a vector, so the acceleration is a vector. But it did not matter what um, velocities we used, you know, um, as long as we divide by the time taken, for the change in velocity to occur. So we, we could pick any two velocities for our object. However, the situation here is quite different because the acceleration of an object undergoing uniform circular motion is not constant. We will see that that acceleration vector changes all the time its direction constantly changes, so it's not a constant vector. So the average acceleration vector will vary, it will depend on what delta t is, unlike the case of uniform linear motion. The average acceleration was just always the same, it was just constant, it was just equal to the acceleration. To get the acceleration of the object at time t, we have to imagine letting the time interval delta t approach zero. So we can imagine that these two points are very close together. So we let the time interval approach zero. So the average acceleration, delta v over delta t, will approach the instantaneous acceleration vector at time t, the acceleration of the object when it's here. Now in the case of linear motion with uniform acceleration, it was quite easy to calculate the numerator of this fraction. We just get the velocity at some later time minus the velocity at an earlier time and divide by the time taken for the change in velocity to occur. In this situation here, we have to subtract two vectors that do not lie along the same line. Okay, These two vectors lie along different lines. So how do we get the difference of two general vectors? Well, to do this geometrically, we have to make the tails of the vectors coincide. So we can move vector v of t down here, so you can move a vector parallel to itself as long as you maintain its magnitude. And we take the other vector, v of t plus delta t, move it parallel to itself so its tail coincides with the vector v of t. We saw in the section on vectors that to get the difference of two vectors, we join the heads of the vectors together. Now, what about the direction of delta v? Well, we need to put the head of delta v at the head of v of t plus delta t, and that's easy to verify using the triangle law. You know, if you add vector v of t onto delta v, 
by the triangle law you must get vector v of t plus delta t that's very easy to check um, because delta v is just v of t plus delta t minus v of t so if you plug the numerator of this fraction in for delta v the v of t's will cancel and you will get v of t plus delta t so we must get the sense of the vector correct the head of vector delta v must be at the head of vector v of t plus delta t now what about the angle between these two velocity vectors how do we know that it's equal to delta t the angle between these two radii well since the velocity vectors are tangential to the circle and since the line joining the center of a circle to the point of contact of the tangent to the circle is perpendicular to the tangent we have two right angles here so the tangents are a pair of lines that make the same angle with this pair of lines and we know that if a pair of lines make the same angle with another pair of lines then the angle between the pair of lines represented by the vectors must be the same as the angle between the pair of lines the, these radii lines so the angle between the velocity vectors is delta theta that's the change in angle theta okay at time t um, the angle is theta and at time delta t later the angle change the angle theta changes by the amount delta theta now what do we notice about this triangle here and this triangle whose two sides are equal to the radius of the circle by the way we need to draw in this line here because I'm comparing this triangle here to this triangle here so the straight line distance between these two points is say L let S be the arc length between the two points you can see that L and S are very close together and L will get closer and closer to S as delta theta goes to zero as we make this angle very very small now these two triangles are similar triangles why is that well they have the same angle delta theta but um, because this is an isosceles triangle this angle here is equal to this angle here this triangle here is also an isosceles triangle because the magnitude of the velocity vector never changes the magnitude of the velocity vector is the speed and the speed is v without the arrow so the length of this vector or the magnitude is v so we also have an isosceles triangle here which means that these two angles are the same but these two angles must equal these two angles um, you know because the three angles add up to 180 okay to calculate this angle here we could take delta theta from 180 and divide by 2 and we do exactly the same here to calculate this angle take delta theta from 180 and divide by 2 and we get the same result so these two angles are identical so the angles in both triangles are the same so we have similar triangles which means that the ratio of corresponding sides of both triangles is the same so let's take the angle opposite or sorry the side opposite delta theta in this triangle it's L the side opposite delta theta in this triangle here is well actually not delta V but the magnitude of delta V delta V is a vector it makes no sense to divide the length of a line by a vector um, so the length of this vector is written like this let's get another pair of corresponding sides we started with this triangle to get L so we go back here the side opposite this angle is R and the side opposite the same angle here is V the magnitude of the velocity vector now we can rearrange this cross multiply and rearrange to get L over R equals the magnitude of Delta V over V essentially we've just interchanged these two terms now as we said before L the straight line distance between the two points approaches the arc length s between the two points as Delta theta approaches zero but that's the same thing as saying Delta T approaches zero you know because the time interval involved is Delta T so if we make the time interval Delta T approach zero then um, the angle subtended by this arc will approach zero so that means we can approximate L over R by s over r 
So we've approximate L by S. It's a very good approximation, which becomes exact as delta theta approaches zero. So we can approximate the magnitude of delta V divided by V by S over R. But what is S over R? It's the arc length divided by the radius. But that's just the definition of the angle in radians. So this quantity is actually delta theta. So we can approximate now the magnitude of delta V over V by delta theta. If we multiply both sides by V, we can approximate the magnitude of the change in the velocity by the speed of the object times delta theta. Let's devote, uh, divide both sides by delta T. Okay, that's what we're after here. We want this ratio delta V over delta T. Now actually, we can't get that exactly yet because here we, we just have the magnitude of delta V divided by delta T. Delta T is just a scalar. So I can actually extend this down over here. Um, because the magnitude of delta T is a positive number and the magnitude of a positive number is positive. So we can approximate this quantity by V delta theta over delta T. And we know that this approximation becomes exact as delta theta or delta t goes to zero. So here our wavy equal signs, approximate equality becomes exact equality when we let delta t go to zero because as if we just back up here, delta t goes to zero, then uh, delta theta goes to zero, which means that we can replace L with S. We can replace the straight line distance between the two points by the um, arc length of this here, distance between the two points. But what is this quantity here? Well, we saw this in the previous video. The, the delta theta divided by delta t is the angle delta theta swept out in time delta t. Well, the angle swept out in a particular time is, is just the angular speed omega. That doesn't change. It doesn't matter what delta theta is. If we divide the angle swept out by the time taken for the angle to be swept out, that number is a constant denoted by the Greek letter omega, also known as the angular speed. By the way, we have to be careful here. This quantity is not the acceleration. It's the magnitude of the acceleration. Okay, so the magnitude of A is V times omega. That magnitude is constant. Because V is a constant, the speed doesn't change. We're dealing with uniform circular motion. And of course, omega is constant. Actually, if the speed of the object or particle is constant, then its angular speed must be constant. So V times omega is a constant. Now, what does change is the direction of vector A of T. So vector A of T is not a constant vector because its direction constantly changes. And that's what we look at next. So, so far we found the magnitude of this quantity, that's the magnitude of this limit, which is actually the same as the limit of the magnitude of delta V over delta T. Okay, an important point for getting the direction of the acceleration vector is to realize that it's the same as the direction of the change in the velocity delta V as delta T approaches zero. Okay, so we're just interested in the direction of this quantity. Delta t underneath, well, that's just a scalar. So the direction of the average acceleration is the same as the direction of the change in the velocity, delta v. Now, as delta t goes to zero, we know that delta theta also goes to zero. Okay, if we make the time interval very small, delta theta will go to zero. We've seen that already. So let's look at the angle between vector delta v and vector v of t, this angle in here. Well, we have an isosceles triangle here. So as delta t goes to zero, delta theta will go to zero. The three angles have to add up to 180 de degrees. So as delta theta approaches zero, these two angles must approach 90 degrees each. Okay, so we get a total of zero plus 90 plus 90, which is 180. So as delta theta approaches zero, 
each of these angles approach 90 each. In particular, angle A, the angle between um, vector delta V and vector V, will approach 90 degrees. So that tells us that at time t, the acceleration vector is perpendicular to V of t. But we know that vector V of t lies on a tangent to the circle at this point, and we know that the line from the centre of a circle to the point of contact of the tangent to the circle is perpendicular to the tangent. So that tells us that vector A of t actually points towards the centre of the circle. We can see that delta V is pointing in this direction. And now we know that um, as delta T approaches 0, then um, delta V will, will uh, the direction of delta V will point towards the centre of the circle. Well, this is only in the limit, of course, as we let delta t and, helps, and hence delta theta go to zero. Before we take that limit, delta v does not point towards the center. But as delta t approaches zero, the direction of vector a of t approaches the center of the circle. So when the particle is here, we have its acceleration vector. When the particle is here, the acceleration vector is different. It's no longer pointing in this direction. It's not like this. It's changed. It's, it's always pointing towards the center of the circle. That comes out from the geometry. What doesn't change is its magnitude. Its magnitude is given by v times omega. Now we can write the magnitude of vector a in a different way. We know from the previous video that v equals omega times r. So we can plug omega r in for v, so we get omega r times omega. That's omega squared r. We can also rearrange this formula to write omega equals v over r. We can plug v over r in for omega to get v times v over r, which is v squared divided by r. So we can use either of these formulas to get the magnitude of the instantaneous acceleration of a particle undergoing uniform acceleration.